Great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, actually, I just wrote an article about cheese that I pitched to Gilbert Magazine, the official magazine of the G.K. Chesterton Society. And I haven't heard back if they're going to publish it or not, but I hope they do. Um, and then Michigan History Magazine, available at fine bookstores everywhere. Um, this presentation is more of a narrative than a thesis-driven presentation. Um, it is about the painter Matthias Alton, who was born in Germany and came to Michigan. And largely unsung, I discovered him, uh, discovered paintings by him at the Grand Rapids Art Museum and picked up this little postcard by him. And I was um, surprised at how little information there actually was about him. His work is absolutely exquisite. <laughs> So this presentation is a brief narrative of his life and his work. So uh, he was actually born in Germany, uh, which was Prussia at the time. And he acquired a, a, a lot of skilled painting people in the town that he was born in, Marpingen. There was a, uh, an apparition of the Virgin Mary and people, pilgrims thronged to this town and they would bathe in this miracle working spring and that's where young Matthias Alton practiced drawing the, the figure um, using whatever rudimentary materials were at hand. He used laundry soap actually instead of paint because that's all he had. But he got very good at it. Um, so many people came to the town of Marpingen that the military was dispatched to just keep order and uh, Matthias Alton sensed a business opportunity so he painted images of the Kaiser selling them to the soldiers who very obligingly purchased them. And he was discovered by a local priest who recognized his artistic talent. And he took him under his wing and put him to use painting religious frescoes and all the local churches. In 1889, his family then moved to the United States, possibly, we think, to avoid military conscription. And they settled first in New York and then in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which had a robust German community. Um, once he was here in Michigan, he put his artistic talents to use, painting images for Phoenix Furniture Company. They would mass produce furniture and then he would hand paint decorations on them to kind of give this factory made furniture sort of a handmade rustic appearance. In 1898, he became an American citizen and purchased a passport on the same day. And one month later in December, he flew to Paris uh, no, sorry, no, I guess he probably didn't fly. He sailed to Paris, <laughs> um, where he enrolled in the Académie Julian, uh, which was a rather prestigious art school, which produced other notable alumni, including Diego Rivera, John Singer Sargent, and Grant Wood. Grant Wood, of course, the painter who painted American Gothic, that iconic scene of the farmer and his wife. Uh, he also studied uh, alongside uh, Henry Moore, um, uh, Modigliani, and Camille Claudel. Um, and we think there's no, there's no hard evidence, but there's, uh, it's been suggested that he probably studied as well with James McNeil Whistler, of course, the painter of Whistler's mother. So after this whirlwind year in Europe, he came back to Michigan and uh, supported himself exclusively as a fine artist. And his early works were described as tonalist, meaning that they were just very subdued and dark in color. Uh, it was a very popular style back then. Are you going to grab the lights? Okay, that, that is good, thanks. So his early tonalist works were just kind of subdued in color, very dark color palette. This is the Grand Rapids Gas Works. Uh, very prominent in all of his paintings are the horses. He actually preferred painting animals over people. He just said they made better models, and he said that they didn't charge any fee. So, uh, in 1912, oh, actually, I do have one, one more quick example of his tonalist period. So in 1912, Matthias Alton made a second trip back to Europe, and this time he goes to Spain in search of the artist Sorolla, who's a Spanish artist who did all these very luminous paintings of the Mediterranean coast. And in Spain, Matthias Alton painted at all the same sites that Sorolla depicted in these images. 
and acquired a much brighter style. So when we look at Matthias Alton's work after encountering the works of Sirola in Spain, Matthias Alton absorbs the exact same style. So this is him kind of going to all the same locations that Sirola painted, painting them in the same way, the bright, luminous color palette. And he came back to Michigan and painted Michigan in this exact same way, just these really vibrant uh, kind of images. Uh, this is up in actually very near Traverse City. I think this is Reed Lake, if I remember correctly. So he's coming out of his kind of dark, subdued tonalist period and just start, injects his paintings with bright, luminous color. And that characterized the paintings for the rest of his life, actually. And I've got just a few more images of his um, post-visit to Spain. This is the postcard that I passed around. Personal favorite of mine. I wish I actually wanted this one to be in the in the Michigan History Magazine, but alas, I have no control over over that. So it was actually during the First World War that he produced uh, all of these paintings. He was unfit for military service by the time. Uh, the First World War was going on. He was about 40 years old. Um, actually, as a German-American, he could have faced uh, some difficulty, but he was well enough respected in his community that he actually did not face the, um, I don't know, the sort of hardships that other German-Americans faced. And he actually did paint a self-portrait of himself wearing the Red Cross emblem to just sort of state his allegiance to to the Allied cause. So even in the 1930s, as other European painters were kind of swept up in all the new isms, um, like uh, Cubism and Fauvism, he stayed true to his impressionistic roots, uh, thinking that it would, he just wanted to rebel against the rebels, actually. And he said that he himself did not find Cubism and all these new versions of art to be bad, but he just thought, it, uh, he, he appreciated it, but he thought better, better other people to be painting that than himself. So uh, actually I do apologize. These images are a bit blurry. His works are not that well known. So even on the internet, it's hard to get kind of good quality images. But in the, in the article, actually, I'll just send this around because this is a really luminous scene. Gulls of Leland, this is Leland, Michigan near the end of his life. He spends a lot of time near Traverse City. And you can see it's, it's a really bright, luminous painting. So one of his final paintings, uh, myself at 66, um, he is pretty old, but still producing art. And this is among the, the last paintings that he makes, where he's kind of looking at us, not really defiantly, but uh, he's, it's as if we are interrupting him at work. He's ferociously working. And he did die in his home and studio, which still exists today in Grand Rapids and is a National Historic Landmark, um, died of a heart attack the same day that he received rave reviews for an exhibit that he was uh, of his work that was held in Chicago. And after he died, he kind of faded into obscurity rather oddly. But recently, within the past 10 years, his work has been sort of re-emerging from, uh, from the shadows, largely because of, um, I believe it's George and Barbara Gordon uh, of Gordon. I think it's Gordon Corporation, in, uh, which is based in Grand Rapids. They are collectors of his work. And they um, financed the Gordon Gallery, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Brand new. Uh, I don't think it's even five years old at this point, And it's completely free. So um, should you ever be in Grand Rapids, uh, wander in. And it's, uh, it contains the, the largest collection, the largest public collection of his works, uh, about 90 of his paintings. And uh, I was talking to the curator of the gallery. And I guess plans are in the works for a Matthias Alton Museum to be in, uh, built in Grand Rapids shortly within maybe the next five years or so. 
And I guess this is a, a good year for Alton because Grand Rapids, um, Grand Valley State University is producing a, a monograph of all of his works. So that, I guess, concludes my, oh, actually, no, this, this will conclude my presentation. Um, he was always asked, uh, of all the places you could paint, why, why Michigan? And people urged him to move to other places like Paris or New York. And he very easily, easily could have done that. But his answer was that Michigan supplied every bit of interesting as a landscape as anywhere else in the world. Um, so in Michigan, he remained. Uh, so Michigan was really the muse that inspired, I think, most of his, his finest works. So thank you very much. For <laughs> Don't know if anyone has any questions or furious rebuttals. But yeah, yes, he did. Uh, married, had three daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a good question. I, he's labeled an Impressionist. Yeah. I don't know what he himself referred to himself as. Yeah. Oddly, I think he, he like, the, the interviews that I've read of him, he kind of defined himself as a rebel by being conservative. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's kind of, uh, with, with the provost here, I'm not sure what to, yeah. Um, uh, maybe I will use that as an advertisement for the upcoming focus uh, talk that I will be giving. Um, I'm not sure what I'll be talking about yet, but I've been roped into it, so I'm, uh, <laughs> so you'll, you'll, you can hear more about art uh, there. Actually, um, the focus talk is, uh, the, the theme is going to be based on the St. John's Bible, which we are lucky to have. So I'll probably be talking about um, I don't know, illuminated manuscripts or, or art books, something like that. Yeah, thanks for that question. Thanks for that support, that, that comment. Yeah, which I'm so glad you gave, especially in the presence of Dr. Rupert. So. All right, thank you.